Zalska. I'm a faculty member in computer science and engineering at the University of Washington. The plan for this session is I'm going to do a 15 minute or less introduction. Then Larry Smarr from UCSD will deliver a keynote for a half hour. Then we'll have a panel, but before that, the three additional panelists will each orient you to what they do for five minutes apiece. And then we'll have a conversation uh, among the panelists and with you. So that's the plan. And, uh, I hope you enjoy the next hour and a half. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is what I call e-science, techniques and technologies for 21st century discovery. Uh, and here, here's the way I think about this. Sensor-driven or data-driven science and engineering is transforming science once again. There's a picture of Jim Gray here, a uh, former colleague of mine at uh, Microsoft Research, who in many ways got this e-science uh, program going nationally by contributing enormously to the data aspects of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, and Microsoft and Microsoft Research through Jim have contributed a set of volumes uh, whose photographs appear there. In particular, the Fourth Paradigm book is really interesting, and I recommend it to you if you haven't seen it, describing this second transformation of science by computation. So what do I mean by a second transformation of science? If you think of the way science is done, there's theory, and there's experiment, and there's observation. This is how oceanography is done. And theory and experiment and observation obviously relate to each other very closely. You know, uh, observations suggest theories, which suggest experiments to validate the theory. This is how science has been driven forward for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. About 30 years ago, science was augmented by another approach, and that was computational science. Now, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but I think of computational science over the past 30 years as having been focused on simulation. That is, let high-speed computers take us to places that we can't go. We can't go to the first few days after the Big Bang. Uh, we can't go to the explosion of nuclear devices. We can't go to urban dynamics and social experiments, right? So simulation allows us to explore those sorts of things that we otherwise can't visit, can't touch and feel. And it has been absolutely essential in transforming a set of fields like astronomy and physics and chemistry over the past 30 years. It's been enormously influential, and it's now really joined uh, theory and experiment and observation as a, a leg of the scientific stool. What's happened in recent years is another form of computational science has been added. That's e-science. And the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is the canonical example. So the difference is e-science is driven by the data rather than by the cycles. And we'll talk about why this is possible and why this transformation is taking place. But it's a second transformation of science driven by high-speed computing and communication. So e-science is driven by the data more than by the cycles. This is a photo of the Apache Point Telescope, which was the telescope used for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And this project, over the course of seven years, collected 80 terabytes of raw image data. What's that? Well, it's a lot of zeros. It's just an enormous volume of data, orders of magnitude more than any science project had uh, ever utilized previously. And Jim Gray's involvement was to build the data repository for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the web portal, working with a number of colleagues at Microsoft and Alex L.A. from Johns Hopkins and a set of folks in the uh, astronomy community. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Andy Connolly, who's a wonderful young astronomer at the University of Washington, Andy was a, a postdoc with Alex L.A. when the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was being moved forward, said that without Jim Gray's involvement, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey would have yielded hundreds of research papers of results as opposed to the 5,000 that it eventually yielded, right? So this data was made available to the entire astronomical community simultaneously, and at the same time, it was made available to uh, individuals, to amateur astronomers, to school children and to teachers. So there's an enormous democratization of science that took place, and it was the first time that large-scale science data was ever put in a commercial relational database system. Previously, the way science is done is you write a flat file or you stick the data in an Excel spreadsheet. I'll say more about this later. But the idea that you would take the data and the metadata and put it in a commercial relational database system and make it available through the web to everyone was absolutely transformative. 
So let me now come back to that number, 80 terabytes collected over seven years, and let's look at the next generation of major science projects by comparison. The next major astronomy project, LSST, generates 40 terabytes a day of data. I should say will generate, okay? So one Sloan Digital Sky Survey every two days. All right, took Sloan's Digital Sky Survey seven years to accumulate 80 terabytes of data. LSST does it in two days. And this is motivated and driven by science. Photographs showing the projected resolution of LSST compared to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey are utterly dramatic. Right? So a huge transformation. But other projects are the same. The Large Hadron Collider is up and running, and it does a Sloan Digital Sky Survey every day worth of data. Right. Uh, gene sequencers, like the next-gen Illumina sequencer, generate a terabyte a day, but this is not some mammoth machine. This sits on a desktop. There's a lab at the University of Washington that has 25 of these. There's a lab on the East Coast that has 100 of them. You'll hear from Larry Smarr shortly, who deals with this sort of data all the time in his, uh, uh, in his center at uh, the University of California at San Diego. Right? So, uh, again, a lab of 100 of these is generating far more than a Sloan Digital Sky Survey every day just in one lab from desktop gene sequencing machines. Uh, I've done a lot of work, as has Larry Smarr and many others, on uh, the Ocean Observatories Initiative. The Ocean Observatories Initiative has three components. There's a, a, a global uh, observatory, a, a coastal observatory, and a regional cabled observatory, regional scale nodes. This regional scale nodes are being built off the coast of Washington, Oregon, and British Columbia as part of this National Science Foundation project, the goal of which is to transition oceanography from expeditionary to observatory-based science. It's going to be utterly transforming, streaming data back ranging from chemical and physical and biological sensors to HD television photos of what's going on. Right? So again, totally transforming. And as with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this data becomes available to citizens and school children at the same time that it becomes available to ocean scientists. Uh, the web is a source of data. And point of sale terminals are a source of data. Right? So all of these are sources of data. And e-science is driven not just by the data, but by the analysis of the data. And that analysis needs to be automated because there's too much of it to look at. There's too much of it in at least three dimensions. The rate, the rate at which it arrives, the volume, the amount of it, and the complexity or dimensionality. Right? How sophisticated is the data? And all of these have increased rapidly over the past couple of years. They're on the Moore's Law curve. I'll say more about that in a second. Right? E-science uses a broad spectrum of technologies from computer science and computer engineering and statistics. Sensors and sensor networks, broadband backbone networks, you'll hear more about that in a minute. Databases and data mining, several of our panelists will talk about that. Visualization, machine learning, cluster computing at enormous scale. Right? So these are technologies brought to the world over the past 5 and 10 and 20 years by computer science and computer engineering and statistics that are making this data intensive science possible. Okay? The collection, the storage and management, and the automatic exploration and understanding of this data. The question of how you go from data to knowledge to action is what all of 21st century discovery is about. Uh, E-science is also married to the cloud. Uh, this is a, a picture from now two years ago of EC2 instance uses by Animoto. How many of you have used Animoto? Yeah, that's what I expected. Not too many people. Here's what Animoto does. It's something that's surprising that anyone would use it, but it's been a very successful young company. What you do is you give them a set of JPEG images and an MP3 audio file, and they produce a syncopated slideshow. Right? And it takes about six minutes of PC computing to produce a one-minute syncopated slideshow. And like many young information technology companies, they don't have any computers. They run on Amazon Web Services. Right? Um, and this is a graph of essentially how many virtual PCs they were using for Amazon Web Services over a period exactly two years ago in April. And you can see that they were pitzing along at 30, 35, 40, 45 virtual PCs. Right? And suddenly, on April 15th, they rolled out a Facebook app and within two days, they were at 3,500 virtual PCs. Right? Now, this is not a problem that you solve by going to the Dell saleswoman and saying, I'd like to have you know, another 
uh, 3,000 computers by Thursday, nor do you go to your venture capitalist and say, uh, you know, you should build me a 4,000 room data, 4,000 machine data center on the off chance I'm successful. Amazon absorbed this. And here's the point of showing you this. Science looks just like this, right? In science, what happens is you're computing along on an experimental basis until a few weeks before a paper is due. And then suddenly you scale up. And then, like Animoto, you fall off again, right? And this belongs in the cloud. This is a, a, a photo from, uh, uh, from Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon.com. It shows the tasting room at a Belgian beer brewery, right? And the tasting room in that brewery is the room where they used to generate electricity. That big apparatus in the middle is the old, now defunct, electrical generator. And the analogy is that five years from now, if you're a university or a scientific company and you're running your own data center, it's going to be about as smart as generating your own electricity. It makes sense sometimes. It makes sense on a small scale, just like solar cells on the roof. But we really have to get computing out of the closet and into the cloud. E-science is going to be pervasive. As important as traditional computational science was, it was a niche. E-science, everyone's going to be doing it, including the social scientists, because they now want to mine 400 million users worth of Facebook data instead of paying 10 undergraduates six bucks an hour to participate in a focus group when they want to understand the evolution of cliques. Um, top scientists get it. One thing we did at the University of Washington was a survey of top scientists from across the university. And what we found was all of them understand that they have a data problem and they need tools. We see workflows across the campus that uh, used to take a half a person day per week. Now we're taking one FTE, and in another couple of years, we'll be taking 10 FTE, and we need tools to attack that. That's the, motivating uh, uh, that's the motivation for something called the University of Washington eScience Institute, which I'm currently directing. It's bring these capabilities to the campus very quickly so we can stay competitive. Let me now talk a bit about computer science, and then I'm done. Uh, I talked about the computer science technologies that uh, e-science is going to utilize. This session, enabling 21st century discovery in science and engineering, is one application of these technologies. But there are many others, right? The extraction of knowledge and the movement to action from data is something that's going to affect all fields, biology, intelligence and decision making, transportation, right? All of these are fields that are going to be transformed by the application of these technologies. There are a set of great things that happened 40 years ago in 1969. Can you remember any of them? What happened in 69? Woodstock. Woodstock, right. Isn't the web wonderful? What else happened in 69? Apollo, the moon landing, all right? What else happened in 69? The first packet on the internet, right? Probably you don't know what the first packet on the internet was. Do you know, Larry? The first packet on the internet contained the characters LO, which were the first two characters of login, and then it crashed. <laughs> I'm not making this up. It was a packet sent by Charlie Klein, Len Kleinrock's programmer at uh, UCLA, to SRI. Right? Now the question is, with 40 years of hindsight, which of those three events had the greatest impact? Right? Uh, it wasn't Woodstock, because nobody remembers a thing. Right? And, <laughs> I would assert that as, as great an engineering achievement as the moon landing was, and as inspirational as it was to humankind, the internet trumps it in terms of impact. Right? My kids and your kids use it every day in many ways. And the reason is really clear. Exponentials are us. Other fields that benefit from exponentials do it because of what computing gives them, the sensors that are driving e-science and the computational power. So this is a phenomenal time, and we in computer science are lucky to be participating in it. You're going to see a revolution in discovery in the next 10 years, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Thank you very much. I'd like to now introduce Larry Smarr to uh, present you with what I know will be a wonderful keynote. Uh, Larry and I go back many decades. Uh, Larry was originally uh, educated as a computational astrophysicist. He did his postdoc with Jerry Ostreicher at Princeton, a renowned astrophysicist. Uh, Larry eventually uh, saw the light and abandoned the dark matter side. And he's now uh, essentially a computer science who uh, 
for many years headed the National Center for Supercomputer Applications and then the National Computational Science Alliance at the University of Illinois, and for the past 10 years now has been running Cal IT2, an institute at the University of California, San Diego, and several other UC institutions that's focused on bringing networking and data and the exploration and understanding of data to scientists around the world. Larry, thanks for joining us. So I'm going to uh, just take up where Ed left off. You know, we, we use the internet every day, um, but the problem is we all use it. And so even though its backbone is about 10,000 megabits a second, those of you who, how many get more than 10 megabits a second over the internet? Okay, not so many. Um, and, and that's because the internet is set up and optimized and your termination devices like PCs or nowadays handheld devices that are wireless, um, they are optimized for megabyte size objects. So if somebody sends you a, an attachment on an email that's several megabytes, in many of your cases, it won't even get through your firewall, and, uh, and so you're, and you're sort of hosed. Well, you notice that he's talking about terabytes. That's one million megabytes. So if you take even a gigabyte, which is only a 1,000, if I sent you an email attachment with a gigabyte on it, it's not going to get, it's like a pig in the python, you know, it's not going to get through. Um, and so that's why uh, over the last decade, we've been taking the same optical fiber network that the shared internet runs over and saying, well, what if we took that 10,000 megabit per second, a 10 gigabit per second uh, backbone that we have for, say, all 200 research universities and in Internet 2, and we gave it to just you. So you got a thousand times the bandwidth as you do normally. Well, then that would mean a gigabyte would be able to act just as quickly as a megabyte does on the regular Internet. And so, uh, for instance, there's something called the National Lambda Rail that has come up over the last um, about five or seven years. Uh, it interconnects optical networks uh, across the country, and <clears throat> it has up to 80 of these 10 gigabit wavelengths that essentially can be given to you on, on demand. Internet 2 has developed something called dynamic uh, circuit networks uh, that's also available. So this is hooking all of our campuses together, um, and one of the big problems is then, how do you get it across the campus to where the user is? But the other big issue is, you saw this picture uh, from our Optiputer project um, in Ed's talk, is how do you terminate that flow? So if your PC is well adapted to this 10 megabits, and now you're getting 10,000 megabits, so 1,000 times more, where do you put that extra 999 bits every second? Right? So you've got to, you've got to sc store, you know, scale up your storage, scale up your computing, and scale up your pixels. And, and so fortunately, everybody's been using Linux clusters uh, over the last decade or so. Uh, they just forget to buy the LCDs for each of the PCs in the cluster. But if you remember, and then you can put them together, you can actually scale this up. And it's clearly this is an interim um, solution because the people who make uh, your LCDs, the engineering of that, they're assuming that the market they're selling to is PCs and those all have edges. But imagine that they don't put the edges on, it's just seamless. In fact, imagine that we don't go to LCDs, but over the next, say, 10 years, engineering develops solutions that allow us to have simply electroactive wallpaper. I mean, look at all the dead walls. <laughs> Everywhere you go, there are dead walls. Okay? If you go to Japan, you're seeing the outside of buildings becoming electroactive using LEDs, but now imagine that essentially everywhere you go, it looks like this. And what that means is you can take high-definition videos from anywhere in the world coming into you to be, in this case, used to uh, collaborate on medical imaging. Those are cancer cells you're seeing there that have been imaged with microscopy. Um, and it's live microscopes coming in on the, on the uh, right-hand side. So this thing we call an OptiPortal came out of the NSF 
uh, project, uh, the Optiputer that I was PI of, uh, that had a lot of folks get together, including people from industry, people from university, to say, let's just go to the end of the rainbow. Let's just assume we have these 10 gigabit uh, links uh, for data intensive science and engineering. What would we do differently? Well, for instance, say you're doing cosmology. Now, you wouldn't know it, but these days on supercomputers, um, getting, say, 5 million CPU hours for a project is a sort of normal allocation. I point out there's only like 8,000 um, hours in a year. So if you have 5 million CPU hours, you're doing a lot of parallel computing for a long time. And this is an example with um, taking the universe and evolving it from very early in the universe to uh, present time and then seeing the large scale structure that comes uh, from the gravitational collapse of small perturbations uh, that were there in the universe early on. Well, Mike Norman is someone who does this, at, uh, who's the interim director of the San Diego Supercomputer Center at UCSD, and he runs at Oak Ridge on one of the NSF Terra grid systems. Um, furthermore, he needs to visualize this. Well, the visualizations alone are 148 terabytes. And so being able to uh, get those movies to him was impossible. So he had his data was sort of trapped in the black hole of the supercomputer center where it was generated. And this is generally what's happening. All those data generators that Ed talked about, the genome sequence and everything else, were getting these islands of data exponentially filling up, and yet because the pipes in between them aren't also exponentiating, we're getting exponentially isolated from our data. And that makes it impossible to do engineering and science because it's the sharing of data and the sharing of people looking at different ways to work on that data that makes our progress possible. So what we've done is an experiment of hooking up the supercomputer generating the data in Oak Ridge to Argon, where they have a couple of hundred of these amazing NVIDIA graphics processors to do uh, three-dimensional movies with, and then from there to San Diego to be able to interactively uh, look at it. And here's an example of the output. These are frames from the movie. That's a little earlier in the universe and then that's later and you can see that, that the matter is getting more condensed and forming clusters of galaxies that the those bright little, the red little dots in the middle of the yellow are big clusters of galaxies forming. And by the way, that picture is about two billion light years on a side. So we don't normally think about engineering the universe. But that's what's happening. I mean, you're actually building a mathematical model that then you can go out and compare with the observations that the Hubble Space Telescope is making, and guess what? You're able to actually reproduce it. So you have the universe in a box, basically, and so you can study this in a lot of ways. We're stuck where we are in the universe. Imagine you want to go to the other side of the universe and see what it looks like looking this way. Well, you can do that. And how does he do it? Well, he has one of these optiportals. Um, and so this is the terminating device to this 10 gigabit path, light path, that goes to Argon to get the movies that went to Oak Ridge to get the output of the supercomputer. Now this is about the only one of the many people who use supercomputers in the country that have this set up. But over the next five years, I think you'll see it becoming routine. And what that means is in terms of tools of scientific discovery, the subject of this session, that you're going to enable the end user to do much more deep visual and analytic analysis of the data they've been generating than was possible before. Well, let me give you another example from biology. So the Moore Foundation, this is Gordon Moore and his wife who um, set up a foundation to fund science, particularly in environmental uh, areas. And they asked me if I would put together a proposal to um, build a data center into which all of this uh, data that was coming from these genome sequencers of sequencing the world around you for the bacterial genome. So, you know, remember that lettuce you had for lunch? Do you think you've got genes in your DNA that can generate enzymes that break down the cellulose in that lettuce, in your human DNA? You don't. But your friends, the microbes in your intestines, 
do, and there are about a thousand or so species of bacteria there, each one with genes to do special uh, things, including your immune system, a lot of things that you wouldn't normally think about. Um, that's been pretty well terra, terra incognita. Can you imagine the insides of your intestine we didn't know that much about? That's crazy. The ocean, you go down, last, next time you're at the ocean, and you go in, the ocean get a mouthful of water, every cubic centimeter of ocean has about a million bacteria in it from hundreds of different species. And so Craig Venner went on his around the world yacht trip and, and then grabbed the water every so 200 miles or so, and then the Moore Foundation funded him and his uh, East Coast Institute, Venner Institute, to sequence them. We really didn't have the notion of biodiversity. You know, we humans are very arrogant. We think that you know, things, mammals with backbones are sort of the, what the earth is all about, the living matter on earth, right? Well, for every human cell, there are about 100 million bacterial cells on Earth. So the planet to first order is microbial with a little fuzz that includes us. Sort of part in 10 to the 8, right? And that world's been invisible. And so now, with these gene sequencers, like, like Ed was showing you, you can actually go in and sequence all this. But where do you put the data? I can tell you, I have so many people come to me from the medical school like every week and say, Larry, they didn't tell me when I got my half a million dollars in my NIH grant to go get a gene sequencer that I was going to have to build a mini supercomputer next to it. And by the way, I forgot to put that in the grant. What's my, what am I supposed to do? Right? So this is, uh, as, I, as he said, exploding everywhere around the world. People are buying these gene sequencers. Well, we built this uh, 512 processor supercomputer, several hundred terabytes, terabytes and we made it so that you could come in over the internet. What we didn't realize is 4,000 microbial metagenomicists would come in and register and use this facility from 75 countries in just the last three years or so. Who knew they were out there? Who knew that there was a microbial metagenomicist? What the hell is that? You know, what, who? Anyway, things you learn. Um, and so they're taking and sequencing their local bacteria, and then they're comparing those genes with everybody else who's collecting. So notice this is a global collective enterprise. But there was no one place to put the data to compute on the data. So we embedded a supercomputer on the data. Rather than send the data to some supercomputer, we sent the supercomputer to the data. And that's because you can afford to do that nowadays. It's actually sensible to do this. But what if you want to actually interact with that at the kind of speeds we were talking about earlier. Well, fortunately, uh, Ed and I and Ron Johnson and a number of others have worked to get this 10 gigabit light paths between UC San Diego and UC Washington, and University of Washington set up so we can do experiments. So here's uh, Ginger Armbrust, who's from a, a faculty here at the University of Washington, and she studies the genetics of diatoms, um, which are these little critters that live on the uh, surface of the ocean, um, you probably don't know much about diatoms, but the fifth breath you take today, the oxygen you breathe in came from the diatoms. They produce 20 percent of the oxygen in the atmosphere. A good reason not to continue to put CO2 in the atmosphere, thereby acidifying the ocean, thereby uh, melting away their calcium carbonate skeletons. Your friends, the diatoms, are in trouble. And one of the things Ginger does is she takes samples from different areas of Puget Sound at different temperatures and salinities and looks at what the genetic difference is. And here she is. Now, this is from our auditorium, like this auditorium here in San Diego. She's in Washington. And that's how realistic it looks when you use, in this case, uncompressed high-definition video to link her lab in the University of Washington with our institute there. This is the kind of linking of the world that's now technically possible. And we don't do it much yet. Those of you, last time you had a video conference, how, how satisfying was that experience? You know, the jerky video and everything else. This is just almost better than being there. MIT, for instance, another example. They, they have a group that is building a supercomputer that can do the ocean, simulate the ocean and atmosphere, and then they add to that, at every point in the, in the ocean, a whole set of microbial species. 
And then depending on the temperature and the salinity of the ocean and trace elements, they grow or don't grow. So it's sort of a Darwinian evolution in the whole global ocean. <laughs> Imagine trying to look at that data. So they built this room size. You can see how big it is compared to the people there. Uh, uh, Optiportal to actually be able to look, and of course that's a dynamic movie of the development of the Earth and going through the seasons and, and, and so forth. There's just so many different things to try to get your head around, and visually is about the only way you can do it. Well, let's go to another area. Uh, again, Ed mentioned the uh, ocean observatories, and again, this is a whole new development at NSF. It will be played out uh, over uh, decades to build into the ocean uh, uh, instruments that enable us to to monitor on a 24/7 uh, uh, either globally, uh, locally, on the, on, along the region, along the coast, or uh, as he said, building out into the ocean. And again, this is for science, education, and 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 the general public. Well, we decided to to try this out, and again, um, uh, the University of Washington took the lead. Um, this is John Delaney, who's a professor here. Uh, and the leader of, of this building the uh, fiber optic cables onto the ocean floor. And so while we were writing, you know, that to get through Congress and NSF and everything, we said, let's just do an experiment. So John, amazingly enough, got a research ship, the RV Thompson, to go off a couple hundred miles off the coast of where you are today, uh, send a two and a half kilometer optoelectronic cable, meaning you can send electricity down to run this robot, this JSON robot, and then you have fiber to send back at these high speeds the HDTV. Uh, we got an HDTV camera, got people to make it ocean ready, put it down there, and this is, um, look at that, it's one centimeter, just to give you an example. This, we have four hours of this video of this otherworldly life that is in the hydrothermal vents, all of which, by the way, uh, are run by that sort of white fuzz you see. Uh, that's bacteria that are able to do chemical synthesis of the hot and uh, mineral rich water coming out of the uh, mantle of the ocean into the uh, one degree above freezing um, ocean floor. So this stuff is in several degrees, several hundred degrees C because of the pressure uh, coming into one degree C uh, ocean. So heaven and hell kind of, and in between that, uh, live all these tube worms and everything else living off the food products of these bacteria. Um, and then there's now getting, uh, closing the circuit, they're doing uh, genome sequencing. We've got a NASA grant to actually take these extreme environments, get their genomes of the bacteria, and then put that back in, the, in, our, in our database. So this is a 25 to 30 year new scientific frontier opening up. And it's a you know, half a billion dollar program. But notice that the cyber infrastructure, the CI is cyber infrastructure, is itself a tens of millions of dollar program. And it happens to be at our institute that we're doing this. We're hiring about 30 new software engineers, uh, got about 20 so far hired, that are gonna be weaving the software of the cyber infrastructure that's going to make this program possible. Now you don't wanna read this slide, I know you can't anyway, but this is the diagram of, of how, engineering diagram of how you're gonna to link together all of those instruments and all the different um, uh, places uh, that are gonna use it from Woods Hole on the East Coast, uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography over here. But you'll notice that it's going through um, the National Lambda Rail and Internet 2 as a backbone. So it's built in now. This, this infrastructure that essentially, how many of you are using the National Lambda Rail directly? Right, Ed, good. Uh, not so many. <laughs> and yet, it's being engineered into the backbone of this new discovery infrastructure that is being built out. And if you'll look, you'll notice Microsoft and Amazon clouds as well as university clouds. So we're already assuming that this transition, which Ed is saying we're just beginning to think about, will actually be what we rely on to put all the data and to have the speed to move the data around. Now if that's the case, then we're gonna end up having um, to have uh, collaborations between all these people that are at different places. And so here is where we're now putting it together. And 
this is from our institute, where we work with NASA and the Lunar Science Institute. That wall where the virtual handshake is going on is one high definition video stream coming to San Diego from the Lunar Science Institute in, in Mountain View in Northern California. Uh, notice they've built a wall, an optoportal on their side, and they're showing the famous Apollo Earth rise as seen during the Apollo missions around the moon um, on their wall. And, and instead of having a face-to-face -face teleconference like you're, you would you know, used to doing, what you do is imagine just taking a wall in your room and having that identified with a wall in another room and then dissolving and so that lab at NASA and the lab here are now one lab, and you're just talking to each other like we're talking to each other. You're seeing each other life size. You're sharing the, the visualization of data-intensive data. They can run our wall. We can run their wall. This is the kind of collaboratory for data-intensive science discovery that I think will be more and more common. It doesn't have to be just 2D. So we've got a version of this using the LCDs that are 3D. You, you may not think that, you know, you're going to be able to do 3D stereo, you know, like Avatar in your home. But ESPN is already going to start sending over cable this year, 3D stereo TV to your home. And so JVC has come up with uh, LCD monitors that can, you know, you put the glasses on like you do when you go to see Avatar. Um, for home, right? So we then put those together, and this is one we built for the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, the new graduate university in Saudi Arabia, uh, which is 22 million pixels. And when you're in there, that virtual 3D world is, is real time. I mean, it's dynamic, and it looks just like you're in that world. So how do we, on our campuses, deal with this? Because a campus infrastructure is actually where the bottleneck is. I mean, remember, we've got all this national fiber optics, and I spent a lot of my time going around to individual campuses, having discussions, bringing together the application people, the networking people, the vice chancellor for research, and so forth. And at UCSD, we actually, if you're interested, uh, these slides will be available. Uh, you can just download this study about so thick from the last couple of years at UCSD. We had a lot of faculty and staff and students get together and come up with what is an architecture on our campus that will radically rethink what we do about our, our computing and storage if we have these 10 gigabit links everywhere? And the, the natural thing that comes to it is sort of imagine, this is a little metaphorical, the center of your campus, the quadrangle, having a digital aquifer under it. And that that has petabytes, okay? So that's got millions of uh, gigabytes of rotating storage that is for everybody on campus. And then you link into that over 10 gigabits. We have about 10 of these, uh, 60 of these 10 gigabit links across UCSD right now into the San Diego supercomputer uh, data oasis. Um, the digital libraries are all linked into this. The ability to have specialized computers that enable you to do this large-scale data analysis that Ed was talking about are linked into it. Uh, people, when they get clusters, instead of building them in their closets in the physics department, they go to a well-run um, uh, machine room and, and build them into the condos, uh, condo clusters. You have essentially on the wall an electrical plug, you have your shared uh, internet, and then you have a place to put a glass fiber in that goes to your instruments. So you can just stream that terabyte a day from the new genome uh, into this. You can do the computing on it, running the computing from your, from your local PC, um, and then having the results come back to you. So it's, think of it as a plumbing for the campus um, that's parallel to but separate from the shared uh, internet. And that's really where we're going. Now, at the same time that these campus clouds, and this is my last slide, are coming along, the very first experiments are being done with some of the commercial cloud providers, and here in the Pacific Northwest, Gigapop, and in California, our state uh, optical network is called Scenic. We've just uh, put up a private peering 10 gigabit with Amazon's uh, compute and storage uh, services so that we can begin to experiment in this new world. Where does it make sense to put my, like the data I'm going to use in the next week or two, 
that might be on the campus. The stuff that I want to get to sometime or I want to keep in case I need to go back to it would be out in Microsoft or Google or, or Amazon or somewhere in the commercial cloud. And I'm going to be able to run all of this stuff from my Droid or for those of you with more proprietary systems, iPhones. <laughs> and, um, and that this, this is really this new world in which data is everywhere, but the ability to compute and store that data and interact with that data is just as sprightly and just as responsive as what you're used to uh, on the smaller data objects of the regular internet. So this is a vision, I believe, that's 90-something percent done. People, are early adopters, are beginning to use this system. And it is going to make possible, when you think about Ed's uh, discussion of just a few of the new super instruments that are coming online, and he just mentioned a few of them. There are many others in radio astronomy and, and lots of other fields. Um, that's going to, I think, lead to a golden age of scientific discovery using these new engineered systems of high performance uh, cyber infrastructure. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Larry. Uh, we're going to have a panel of four people uh, emceed by me in a few minutes. And what I'd like to do is ask each of the three additional panelists to come up and talk to you for just five minutes so you'll have the context of their work. Uh, first, I'd like to invite to the stage Catherine Van Ingen. Uh, Catherine is, a, again, a longtime collaborator of mine. Uh, she's a partner architect with Microsoft, uh, was for many years a partner with Jim Gray, and that's the context in which I first met her. Uh, these days, her work is focused on the management of sensor data for the environmental sciences. So, uh, Catherine, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ed. It's really easy in when we talk about, particularly as computer science folks, to talk about big data, petabytes, exabytes, terabytes. What I want to talk about today is, I think, a separate challenge, which is how we mix that big data with little data. In the environmental sciences, we really live in fantastically interesting times. We're at the center of a perfect storm of data between satellites, sensors, cheap computing, networking from Larry, as well as burgeoning web services. There's also a very strong science driver. It's no longer as interesting to study a small watershed or to study only hydrology. Being able to synthesize both in space, time, and across disciplines is becoming more and more important. A primary driver for that is global change. So while we're at the center of this perfect storm, there's a lot of challenges left turning those ones and zeros into actual science. I'd like to use an example to explain what I'm talking about. I'm going to be talking about how we compute evapotranspiration from satellites. So what is evapotranspiration? Let's talk about water balance here for a minute. Water comes in from the sky as precipitation, runs off primarily through rivers and other things, can be retained in reservoirs, lakes, and the groundwater, and also either evaporates from standing water or is transpired by plants back to the atmosphere. So input, output, output, change in storage. Long term, change in storage is zero. So that lets you do a simple calculation from sensor information, rain gauges, stream gauges, of evapotranspiration. The plot that I'm showing you there is in the Russian River, where, where it's a Mediterranean landscape. It's a very nice correlation. It's a beautiful science result, simply done because of internet data ac access from the USGS and from the NCDC. Easy to do, but only good for long term. How do we compute evapotranspiration short term? Well, there's a really ugly equation. Two equations, they're both ugly. What should you learn about the equations? Why am I showing it to you? Well, for starters, there's an awful lot of inputs. So this is a gigantic reduction operation where you take an awful lot of data in and compute a single number. 
or a single time series or a single other raster. Second thing to notice, and it's not a little bit more subtle, is the fact that not all of those inputs are simple variables. In particular, I want to draw your attention to the connectivity or resistivity to landscape. It's something you can measure in the lab. It's something you can measure very, very tightly nearby a plant. But when you try to average over a real landscape, you have to develop a heuristic. You cannot simply use a single number. One other minor little detail with this equation, it doesn't work if the landscape is covered by snow. So you have to know when to use it and when not to use it. So how do we compute ET from satellites? It takes three kinds of data. First of all, it takes the satellite imagery. Fortunately, NASA flies the birds. They run the DACs. Internet download works, although it does take about two days to download a single year of the source imagery. We also need those heuristics. And unfortunately, I don't think you can see it well. Up in the upper right, oh, excuse me, upper left, is a collection of sensors from around the world has, that have been operated by the FluxNet collaboration, a collection of, of about 500 scientists. That gives us that heuristic to compute the connectivity. We download into the cloud the imagery, use the cloud computation just like the Amazon case where we have a spike, and then actually deliver analysis reduction. That's where that sensor data comes in the second time, because how do you know you're getting the right answer? Well, you compare it at a specific point in time. Where do kilobytes come in? Kilobytes come in in the very, very lower part. In the case of fires, you need to know that. You also actually want to compare the resistivity that you've used, the results you've used, again, with field measurements. Field measurements, in this case, is someone actually going out, shooting a branch off a tree, dropping it, taking it back to the lab, and running an experiment. So it's very hard one data, but key to the overall understanding. Closing thoughts, it all comes together. Petabytes, terabytes, kilobytes. That's a challenge, because handling petabytes is quite a bit different than handling kilobytes. The example I use is the following. Petabytes are hard to move and easy to know where you got them. Kilobytes, the minute I give a spreadsheet to Ed, I have no idea what happens next. So it's a great challenge. We're all learning how to do this. It is a combination of e-science, both science and computing science. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. She used the word mashup in that last slide, although she didn't uh, utter it. And that's important, the notion of integrating data from multiple sources and data of multiple kinds really leads to new discoveries. And that's, again, part of what e-science enables. Uh, our next panelist is, panelist is Jonathan Chang. Uh, Jonathan joins us from Facebook, where he's on the data science team. Uh, like Catherine, he has a degree from Caltech. and. Uh, He's uh, within inches, apparently, of finishing his PhD at Princeton, if uh, ah, millimeters even. All right, Jonathan, thanks for being here. Hey. So this is about uh, engineering the tools of discovery uh, and science. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about something which I think is a great tool for science, but wasn't really engineered as such, and that is Facebook. Um, why is Facebook a great tool for science? Well. It's got a ridiculous number of people on it. So we're over, and by the way, this slide is like perpetually out of date. So just assume that the numbers are too small. Uh, over 400 uh, million people on, are on this site every month. Um, 20 billion minutes spent every day. Two and a half billion photos uploaded every month make it the largest photo site on the web. And over three and a half billion pieces of content shared every week. Right. So all this information means that people are basically spending their time on Facebook, their lives on Facebook, and that allows uh, people like social scientists and data scientists to measure and monitor behaviors and interactions of people in ways that were much more detailed and precise than we could ever do before. And uh, because of these new measurements, because of all this new big data, I think we have the potential to really get to and answer a lot of the long-standing uh, questions in things like social science, which we've just been unable to answer before. OK, so more data, more problems, right? So um, yes, it's the richest so, uh, social data set in the world. It also means that it's huge. It's over a petabyte of data. Um, that's a petabyte of all of you like 
updating your statuses and uploading photos. And hopefully you're doing that right now. Um, yeah. Um, and to deal with that, you need, you need tools, right? So we, you need a lot of nodes. You need to do uh, distributed computing, things like Hadoop and MapReduce. And uh, we also have a great system called Hive, which essentially puts a relational database on top of a MapReduce framework that allows us to do structured queries on top of this rich data set. Um, and this means that we can easily process terabytes a day, and we're adding terabytes every single day to this data set. Um, so I want to touch on a few of the things that sort of you can do when looking at this data, uh, some stuff that our group has been looking at. So one of the things you can do is just look at what people are talking about. It's super simple. Um, uh, you can look at all the words that are being generated, messages, status updates, comments, et cetera. So, and then slice by various features like demographics, uh, age, location, gender, et cetera. So you could, for example, um, try to figure out where people are getting laid off, or you could try to figure out uh, how people refer to vodka differently, depending on your gender or age. So as it turns out, if you are uh, extremely young over here and slightly male, you will tend to use the word uh, drunk. Um, and maybe if you're, more, if you're a little bit older, maybe female, you'll probably uh, mention cranberry more often. Um, I mean, this is really cool stuff, and this is stuff that you can, I mean, right? Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that this kind of information is really difficult and expensive to get traditionally, right? There's no way you could have you know, asked a bunch of people about vodka or like, that you would even think of doing that. But the fact is, we have a lot of data, and a lot of data means that you can get fine-grained answers to a lot of questions. Um, another example of this, we built a great tool called Lexicon, which allows you to just plot words and see what the trends are. Um, so for example, you could plot uh, party versus hangover and see pretty reliably that every Saturday, uh, a lot of people mention partying, and every Sunday, a lot of people um, mention hangovers uh, <laughs> with incredible regularity. You'd think they learned their lesson. Um, <laughs> And uh, the peak hangover day happens to actually be uh, New Year's Day, which uh, happens one day after the peak uh, party day, which is New Year's Day, or sorry, New Year's Eve. Um, yeah, so that's all fun and games. And um, one of the people on our team, Adam Kramer, actually did a great study to try to look at how happiness, if you can uh, discern happiness using these status updates, and happiness, again, is one of these things where people like Gallup go around and they call a bunch of people and they have people take surveys on a fairly regular basis to try to get at this. It turns out, if you look at status updates, they actually correlate really well with user self-reported happiness. And he actually did this study, uh, recruited a bunch of people, had them take these traditional surveys, and found that the positivity and negativity in their status updates uh, correlated with the, their survey responses uh, their surveys, rather I should say, their survey responses uh, were predictive of their positivity and negative, negativity in their status updates going back two years, um, which is really interesting. So we actually put together a tool so you can actually look at um, happiness. Since I'm short on time, I'll go quickly. Um, another thing you might want to look at is ethnicity. Um, so there are a lot of like great, oh, okay. Yeah, okay, so since I have to stop now, um, just some punchlines. One, uh, yes, people are very homophilous in ethnicity, so birds of a feather do flock together. Um, and also, uh, as it turns out, there's a lot of interesting things you can do by looking at where you and your friends live. And in fact, you can do a pretty good job of predicting where you live based on where all your friends live. So, um, yeah, so since I'm out of time, Facebook, really rich data set, and it, I think it can really help us answer a lot of the questions that people have had for a long time about society. And I also think that this kind of data actually opens the possibility to a lot of new questions, which like, we haven't even thought of yet, and hopefully we'll get some ideas today. Thank you. Well, facetiously, I would say thank you for confirming my suspicions about the social sciences. But, uh... <laughs> More pragmatically, there is a, a huge storehouse of information here to be mined for discoveries in ways that are probably a whole lot more reliable than surveys, right? I mean, I know how I respond to surveys, which is how I think people want me to respond. 
right? And uh, that's different than how I post to Facebook or Twitter, which is uh, how things are actually going. Our uh, final panelist and final short speaker is Alan Halevi. Uh, Alan manages the uh, Structured Data Management Research Group at Google. He was formerly an uh, a, a, a extremely valuable faculty member in computer science and engineering at the University of Washington. He uh, did a startup. Google bought the startup. They bought him. And uh, that's the way the world goes around. So Alan, thank you for joining us. OK, so um, I'm not going to talk about data sizes today. Uh, a Google guy talking about data sizes is, is last decade's news. Instead, I'm going to talk about um, something much scarier. Uh, I'm going to start scaring you first. Uh, so this is a picture of the temperatures in the different growing seasons in uh, Peru and South Africa as they're projected to be in, uh, in 50 years. And what you're seeing here, don't, you know, don't, don't believe anything I say about this. Go to uh, Carrie Fowler's uh, TED Talk. The bottom line here is that the coldest season today, sorry, the coldest season in, in, in 50 years from now is going to be warmer than the hottest season uh, that we have today, okay? which means um, that our grandchildren are not going to have any food to eat. Okay? There are a few approximations here, but by and large. Um, and so they're not going to be able to be drunk and, and you know, have hangovers like Facebook, and, and all your fun is going to go away. So what's happening is this guy, who actually looks much better in practice, um, uh, so they're collecting seeds of, uh, of various uh, uh, agricultural stuff. Okay? And they're putting them in, in warehouses in order to be able to do research on them to figure out which of these grains, which grains can actually survive in the temperatures that we're expecting to have in 50 years from now. Okay? The problem is, so there, there are dozens of these uh, being collected around the world, and now uh, the problem is that researchers who need to figure out what grains are going to be able to grow in 50 years need to find these things. And so the problem starts here. So there's no way to find this stuff. Okay? You go on your favorite search engine. You, the, in order to find any, any collection, you have to know, first of all, which institution focuses on the kind of data that you're looking for. Okay? which already narrows down your search, your, your ability to find stuff. Even when you find the institution, you have to go through uh, a bunch of searches. And when you finally find the database, then you have all kinds of problems like, hold it, they organize the data in a different way than what I'm going to search for it right now. Or they're using terminology that I don't understand, which basically means that it's incredibly hard to find this data, and therefore the progress on, 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 on doing this is, is very slow. And it's not just a matter of, oh, it's going to take me an hour instead of a minute to find this data. It's, no, I'm not going to find this data at all because there's just no way to do that. Okay, so this is just one example, uh, but I can give you other examples. For example, uh, people are collecting blood specimens from uh, people in Africa in order to study how blood is being, uh, or diseases are, are, are going from animals to humans in order to prevent, uh, you know, the next HIV. So, for example, Nathan Wolf's uh, work over there, or people in Costa Rica are collecting species about all, uh, you know, about they're trying to preserve all the species in the world, but again, they're trying to share this data with a lot of other people. So. The problem that I want to point out today is the boundaries, the, the different boundaries and, and, and barriers that there are in order to actually make use of any of this data. Okay, so the first one is there's really very little incentive for people to share data. Even put aside the fact that I want to publish my article before I want to share the data, the problem is it's too hard to do this and the, the, the return on the investment to the person who owns the data is very, very small so people don't do this. Okay? So, so the government, for example, is going now through a big effort to uh, release all the data, but just putting it on the web does not actually mean that it's going to be very useful for anybody. Okay? Data, databases today support you know, query answering over large amounts of data very quickly, but that's only the beginning of the story. After you find the answer to your data, especially when you're starting to collaborate among multiple people, you want to start discussing data and, and, uh, and making more value ab uh, about it. I already showed you the problem of terminologies, that people use different terminologies, and therefore when you put it together, all hell breaks loose. Okay? And I'm not even talking about linguistic differences. And finally, one of the big challenges here is that structured data and unstructured data are treated very differently in very different systems. So for example, if you look at this table, it's a beautiful piece of structured data. Right? It's on the web. I have 150 million of these in my little back pocket at, at Google. The problem is, how do you know what, what this means? Well, if you look at the unstructured data around this, then you know that this table is actually the winners of the Boston Marathon um, and the Men's Open. Okay? So, so much of the meaning of structured data exists in the text that surrounds it. That's problem number one. Problem number two is when people start looking at structured data, they start having discussions and they start having, adding more value to the data with text. The problem is we have no way of separating, of, of putting together the text and the structured data. We have to forget about 
the fact that these two kinds of data are managed by separate systems. Okay, so we're, as, as one small example of what we're trying to do at Google is we're trying to build systems, uh, a system, Google Fusion Tables, that tries to address this challenge. Okay, so databases are known to be slightly easier to use than, uh, than flying a 747, and we're trying to, not to make it harder, to make it much easier for uh, a lot of people to use. So one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're sticking attribution everywhere you go. So here's a table about coffee uh, production, and you can see that I put the, the attribution for the International Coffee Organization. No matter what you do with that data, that attribution never goes away, okay? So that's one way to, to provide incentive. Um, we do stuff for you that you think the system should do for you, okay? So if you have a, a table that has a column with countries, duh, we know what countries look like. So we can suggest a visualization that all of a sudden shows you, okay, this is where coffee is being produced in the world. So do stuff for the user that the user ordinarily had to do um, on their own. Be able to share this data. Uh, put it uh, on the web so other people can find it with, uh, with search. Uh, be able to merge data from multiple organizations, okay? Um, and be able to discuss the data in a fine-grained way. So this, I'll leave you with this uh, picture here, which is we need to enable this virtuous cycle of discovery, extraction, manipulation, adding further value, and therefore publishing, pu publishing the data back so people can actually add uh, more value to structured data. Done. We should actually leave Alan's last slide up because that's the story here. It is how do you extract knowledge from data using a combination of human and automated means, and that's what's going to be enabling discovery in the next uh, decades. So you've heard uh, a great presentation by Larry on this new e-science and a set of great examples from uh, sort of physical science and engineering domains. Uh, you've heard from Catherine about uh, the fact that discovery involves big data and medium data and small data and data mashups. Uh, you've heard from Jonathan about some of the really exciting things we can do in social sciences uh, through access to data. Uh, you've heard from Alan about the need to uh, integrate uh, unstructured and structured data in order to make uh, discoveries and the difficulty of, uh, of dealing with unstructured data on the web. Uh, so that's sort of the, the playing field that we're dealing with, we're going to have a, a brief discussion among ourselves, and then we'll open it up to questions from you for the panelists. So uh, please uh, think of what you'd like to know from these great folks and uh, be prepared with your questions. L let me uh, ask Catherine first, what, what do you actually think the impact of the cloud is going to be, and what don't you think the cloud is going to do for us? Where do you actually think things are going? And by the way, I have to say as a parochial Seattle sort of person, I uh, I imagine that among the big cloud providers are clearly going to be Microsoft and Google and Amazon.com. And it's just worth noting that two of those are headquartered in Seattle and one of them has a very significant presence here. So I think in many ways, clouds are us in more ways than one here in the Seattle area. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine. I think the cloud actually does two really, really important things for science research. And the first thing it does is democratize access to computing. Uh, I'm working with a lot of scientists who would otherwise be computing on their desktop. They don't have access to a supercomputing center. They don't really want to go through the hassle of putting up a cluster. So that ability to get computing on demand for the time that I need it, I think is extremely important. The second thing I think that clouds do is that it enables the possibility of access to curated data sets. Just as you were saying, data in the wild is problematic. You don't know what it means. You don't know whether to trust it. You don't know what to do with it. Uh, you don't know where it came from. So the ability to have living, breathing data sets where the curation can be amortized across a number of different similar data sets, I think is turning out to be extremely important. Right, this question of provenance, where did the data come from and what transformations has it been through is critical and we tend to lose track of this. And when does it get updated and when does it get changed and how was it used? Because data actually has value to the provider of data. One of the incentives for people to share data is that when their funding agency comes by and said, well, what, what good is it? They can sort of say, well, you know, there were actually 14 people that used my paper for the following reason, and three guys over here took it over into a model synthesis, and, then, and that's a wonderful story. Got it. Great. So, Larry, you presented a, a, a picture 
that was a, a, a spectrum of resources in the lab, on the campus, in the cloud. And I wonder, can you say a little more about that future architecture and also what outfits like the National Science Foundation can do to encourage a rational national and global architecture for, uh, for this modern science? Well, I think the fundamental thing that is going on in all campuses is that the work of our scholars whether in the humanities or arts or science or engineering, um, is becoming digital. Mm -hmm. And we work, for instance, with our music department, which has been a longtime uh, leader in, in digital music. Um, actually, medievalists were some of the first people in the humanities to get on the networks, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, and so imagine now this campus and the way you got to think about it is in every building, in every office, bits are being generated. <laughs> you know, just everywhere. It's like termites. And, and, and so where are all these bits going to be stored and archived and curated? And who's going to take care of that? In other words, whose response? Is it the library? Is it the department? Is it the you know, networking folks on campus? Um, and, and then for how long? You know, papyrus works pretty well for thousands of years to, re, you know, um, to record data. I can't read email that was on a computer that I had, you know, 15 years ago because all the parts no longer work and it's a different operating system and so on. So I mean, My version of that story is a, a book I wrote now 25 years ago in the early 1980s became inaccessible in digital form because the tape could no longer be read, the tape on which I'd stored it. So my solution was to scan it and turn it into PDF and OCR it. So the, the papyrus saved this book from going extinct. It's really right. bizarre. So, so this is a national and international debate and discussion. And it has been underway for some time. Library of Congress has been very helpful in this. But you know, try putting any of this on your NSF grant. Yeah. Right? I mean, who's going to pay for this? And, and think about all those petabytes of rotating storage. Well, in three years, they're out of date. And you've got to get new ones. Who's going to pay for that? And how are you going to keep moving? Whose job it is to move the bits from one medium to the next medium to the next medium, which is the archiving problem? So this is something that I think we need a lot more attention. I think it's almost one of the grand challenges of, of engineering. And, um, and, and then there's all the different federal agencies. Is NIH going to have the same? policy as NASA, as DOE, as NSF. So um, until that debate gets a little clearer, it's kind of hard for campuses, which are so strapped for cash right now, to imagine making investments because invest in what? Where? You know? And so I think the cloud may turn out to be an interim solution because um, you know, if you think about using Gmail or Yahoo Mail or something like that, you just take it for granted that all the bits in your emails from years ago are there and instantly available, and you don't know how they do it, and you don't care how they do it, but you expect that it's being done. And so, if you, I mean, that is cloud. And so, if we now imagine moving our science data into this same environment, uh, it may well be that that's in the short term where we go. But I think we're going to have to figure out what, you know, the cloud by being mass market is, is, is not going to give you the kind of, you know, gigabyte per second access that a highly tuned local uh, high I.O. storage cloud does on your campus. I mean, why, from a business point of view, would you do that if you were in a cloud? How many customers do you have, right? So I think you're going to need both. Uh, and. Uh, uh, but there's not a national architecture yet. So, Alon, I'm interested in incentives for data sharing. And this is complicated. I think traditionally, you know, if I think about uh, astronomy, it's easy to talk about fields about which I know almost nothing. It's, it's pretty clear that in the old days of astronomy, you would spend three years building a sensor. And then you would bid for telescope time. And you would mount the sensor in the telescope. And you would sit on the mountaintop for a week, freezing your tail off. And at the end of that, you certainly weren't going to give that data to anybody else because you had sacrificed uh, three years and one week of, of your life to gathering the data. 
what colleagues have told me about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is that the, uh, the folks collecting that survey data realized that there was more science that could be far more science, orders of magnitude more science could be done than essentially they and their students and postdocs could possibly do. And they shared the data. And this has now become wired into the astronomy community, something that Jim Gray always said was working with astronomy data is great because everyone knows that it's of absolutely no commercial value, right? So you don't have these sorts of IP problems. But the question more generally in science is, how do you bring about that culture change in which people are willing to publish and share their data. I, Larry and I know through the ocean sciences community that's a, a challenge bringing about that, that culture change there. And I'm sure that's true in other fields. So what, what are the incentives that can be put into place to make this happen, do you think? Or does it take the hammer? Uh, so a great question. Uh, it probably takes a little bit of a hammer. But um, so first of all, you have to make it really easy to do. Okay? If, if sharing your data means putting you know, an engineer or somebody in your lab to work for, for uh, some significant amount of time, then people aren't going to do it. So if, if it's easy, then, then the equation becomes different. Okay? And then I think Catherine touched on the, on the real point, which is self-measurement. So one of the things that we do is when you share a table, we, we, uh, we actually count how many people looked at it. So now you can go and say, hey, I shared this table with the world. And look, a 1,000 people looked at it in the last day, day and a half. That, first of all, that counts for you as, as uh, you know, it gives you a sense of self-accomplishment. Uh, but, but when it starts counting for, uh, you know, for your promotion and, and, and tenure, and, and for those of you who need tenure, <laughs> uh, then, then it becomes really important, right? So if, you know, today's Sightseer, right? I mean, today we're, we're using Sightseer or Google Scholar as a major indicator. I mean, these things come up in, in faculty discussions, whether yep. they're scientific or not. This should be the same thing for, for data, OK? Or, and you should be penalized for not sharing the data that you have. So why didn't you share this data? So ease of use and, and self-measurability are two Great. things that I could Yeah, share. some of us had a really interesting discussion at dinner last night over this topic. Larry was pointing out that he, uh, he tweets and Facebooks regularly these days in order to disseminate knowledge of what his uh, organization and his lab and he himself are doing. And there were others who, uh, well, let me just say that I think the general question is, is this a form of publication? Is it a form of communication? Does it count? Uh, you know, Bitly keeps track of who's actually following the URL for you. There's data there. So this self-measurement is important. And it's pretty clear that we're in the business of dissemination and reputation building. And uh, there is the question of, of, I guess, validation of the results, which traditional publication mechanisms uh, uh, play an important role in. So it's not like that sort of work and the curation becomes uh, unimportant, but there clearly are many new ways to reach people, and they have to start counting. Well, another point is, if, if you think of sharing your data as a way of enhancing your own data so you can actually get more value out of it, then, then you're, you're uh, adding another um, factor to the, to the return on the investment here. So I have data. I don't know how good it is. But hey, let, let, you know, let other people have their graduate students look at it and tell me. Okay? And yep. In that case, we'll, we'll get a better data set, and, and I can continue doing what I want to do with it. So one of the issues with sharing data is privacy and anonymity. And that's certainly something Facebook faces all the time. So I, I wonder what you think the prospects are for you publishing to the community at large the sorts of data that social scientists would need to do the sort of work that one can do within Facebook. There have obviously been a set of accidents in the past couple of years involving AOL and others. And uh, there's a lot yeah. of, by the way, research work on things like differential privacy these days that will ultimately, hopefully, address this issue. But it turns out that you can uh, infer an enormous amount from yeah. what is apparently anonymized data, which makes it really difficult for a company like Facebook or Amazon or Google or Microsoft to, to share data openly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So uh, our group is sort of in a bind, because on the, on the one hand, uh, you know, we, f we feel a strong affinity towards the academic community and, and want to get this data out there. But on the other hand, you know, this is data that's, you know, subject to the uh, 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 privacy constraints that we have. And obviously, we want to respect our users' privacy and trust. Um, so we can't just, you know, hand it over to everyone. And um, like Ed mentioned, um, there's been a lot of research on most of the research has basically said that uh, Anytime you try to give away anonymized data, someone will find a way to de-anonymize it. So especially in the case of network data, where um, essentially you can look at the shape of the network in your neighborhood, and you can actually figure out a, exactly where you are if in a completely anonymous network, just based on the shape. Um, so because of that, we still haven't figured out a good way of you know, disseminating 
uh, the data in a safe way? Um, it's an open question that we're actively working on. <laughs> I mean, the, the potential is enormous, and the uh, certainly uh, again, the important thing to realize is people have worked very hard at attempting to anonymize data and thought they had done a good job, and right. it just turns out that you can trace it to somebody in rural Texas. It's I mean, not, Netflix is another example right. of of an organization that wanted to release a more sort of social data set, and there they also ran into the same problem where they couldn't figure out a way of safely anonymizing it. Right. Right. Let's see if we've got some questions from you folks. Uh, otherwise, I will just consume the remaining 20 minutes. But we're happy to have some questions from you for this great panel. Rick. Please, Rick. The last one. So we, we've talked about uh, the challenges of managing massive data sets and transmitting massive data sets and sharing. What about abstracting meaning and models? And I'm thinking about as we observe, whether it's the climate system, whether it's complex biological systems, um, there's this human activity of extracting real meaning and modeling. Are, are there advances coming in how to do that better? Is that just something that you know, people like Larry and his colleagues just are intuitively good at doing it? Or where, where do we see that going in terms of actually doing the, the modeling that exploits the data? Larry? Well, one way is that one of the best pattern recognition computer systems uh, ever created is the brain. And, and the eye brain system, the human eye brain system in particular. Uh, and so one of the things that, that we've done is uh, we've constructed, you know, you're looking at a million pixels right there. That's basically what your PC does. And so we've constructed a 300 million pixel wall. And that means that you can bring up uh, objects and see them um, and sort of the clarity you would on a PC, but you can bring up hundreds of them at the same time in a way you could never do on a PC. And an example is Lev Menovich, which is uh, uh, one of the top uh, critics of, of new media. He's famous around the world for that. I challenged him to be thinking about how can you do scalable analysis of humanistic and, uh, data. And so he does things like get all the paintings of an author from their entire lifetime. And because they're digital objects, you can then begin to ask questions about those that art critics have never asked before, and, and, and such as, you know, how does, over time, does the use of color, shape, sizes, all these things change? And there are these really definite patterns. But when you can just have the entire life's work of this person standing in front of you, and you can quick just change the coordinates, and it just all reorganizes itself the brain is able to make all of these insights that going and studying a, a one painting at a time would never have given it to you. And so I think empowering us to do what we are evolutionarily developed for, um, I mean, we, we've got this weird exponential bottleneck that we've allowed to occur in which the computing power, say compared to 10 years ago on your PC, is say a thousand times greater the storage is maybe 10,000 times greater, and the number of pixels, the actual thing that enters into the iBrain system for you to get meaning from, is the same as it was 10 years ago. So it's an exponential bottleneck. And, and until we break that open, um, you know, I, I think we won't be able to use the best meaning computer ever created or evolved, I guess. So one more comment on this is there are a number of efforts these days to combine human computation and machine computation, because of course humans and computers are very good at different sorts of computations. We have a great pattern recognition and pattern analysis engine, and computers are bad at that. We're not so good at multiplying, computers are great at that. Uh, Louis Von Anna at Carnegie Mellon uh, observed that the number of person hours spent playing computer solitaire in a day is the number of person hours that it took to build the Panama Canal, right? So pe people are willing to do all kinds of things in return for points. So Luis and uh, David Baker at the University of Washington, for example, a phenomenal biochemist, have a number of games that engage humans in partnering with computers to solve problems that, uh, that uh, computers are not so good at, but together we can do it. Alon, did you have something to add? Yeah, so, so since you can't uh, do it, I'll plug some work from the University of Washington. Uh, I think a great example of, of extracting uh, knowledge from a, a huge amount of text is what Ornizioni is doing with the Know-It-All project, where essentially what he's doing, this is a project going on for at least five, seven years by now, uh, what he's doing is look, looking for patterns on the web. So if you look at uh, uh, patterns uh, X such as Y, cities such as Paris, London, and Berlin, okay, you find these patterns on the web 
many, in many, many places, and you can start counting how many times you see them. And, okay, so, so you can derive from that that Paris is a city. That's, that's a huge surprise. But, uh, but you can also derive from that, uh, since, since the web talks about everything, you can actually find lists of all kinds of chemical compounds and, and species and what have you. So these things give you knowledge that is about everything, very, very broad, much more than any human or a collection of humans could, uh, but could, could produce in, in a concerted effort. Um, it's dirty. I mean, you're going to get all kinds of uh, uh, meaningless stuff there, but you can actually start mining human knowledge in a way that we haven't done before, and that's what he's been doing. Great. Let me ask each of you to introduce yourselves as we go along. The last question was from Rick Lefebvre at OVP Venture Partners in UW. Please. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Shot Tosin. I'm a student at the University of Washington Computer Science. Um, so uh, you guys are talking a lot about um, large-scale data analysis and sharing data between um, different institutions. And obviously, for that, uh, you need a lot of infrastructure. Um, currently, you know, what we have on the internet is a bunch of private networks that are interconnected. Uh, you guys said you were working with uh, Internet2. Um, so I want to know more about um, what kind of relationship, I guess, uh, the academic community uh, is going to have with these networks. Um, what kind of business model are we, are we paying them for this kind of stuff? And are there perhaps any concerns about um, I guess, uh, having increasing dependence on these private networks? Probably this is a Larry question. So uh, campuses pay uh, nonprofit groups like Internet2 and National Land Burial to be part of them and have access to the uh, bandwidth. In fact, they're a membership organization. Um, and so although the uh, underlying fiber is, say, bought from level three or some private company, or it's leased, basically. It's entirely run by the university community and uh, owned and operated, basically, by them. The, the problem is that it hasn't been architected in an end-to-end, -end, that is, from the end user to wherever the data generator is. Uh, and most of that, as I say, ha that, that investment that has not occurred is, is on the campuses themselves, which is ironic that the campus would be paying for the external networking and yet not for the, think of a city. If all you had is city streets and you want to interconnect with the interstate highway system, that's not going to work very well. So that's why we built freeways inside of the city to have high speed corridors that can take off the city streets for people who are going to say getting across town or getting onto the interstate. And that's what we're missing right now in campuses, although a, a number of campuses are beginning to realize that and, and, and come forward and make those investments. Let's take the last question, okay? Hello, Charlotte Lee, Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering at the University of Washington, formerly of Cal IT2. Uh, I just uh, wanted to thank you for a very interesting panel. Uh, we've heard a lot today about social scientists being consumers of massive quantities of data, and I absolutely believe that this is an exciting uh, route for the future. But I also, and forgive me, uh, Ed and Larry, who have heard this pitch before, uh, but I also think that there's a, a place in this work and a useful place for social scientists to study the use of uh, um, these massive data sets. Yes, uh, we've talked about people sharing, doing data sharing, people trying to agree upon standards. Uh, we've talked about um, creating culture change, and I think part of that is understanding what the culture is to see what parts can we leverage in the existing culture um, that can help bid, build bridges between the culture and between uh, you know, all the great new possibilities we have in the technology. So I know you've been supportive of that before, but I thought I'd bring that into the conversation. Well, I just say one of the things that I'm most fascinated with right now is how we in, in the physical and biological computer sciences um, are ignoring a revolution in the social sciences that Jonathan uh, and his people and the social network space are, are creating. I mean, science is the ultimate social network. I mean, every time you read an article someone else wrote, that's asynchronous social networking, and then you reference those and so forth. And so the whole global scientific enterprise is this giant social network, but instead of, you know, like um, there's no structure, there's no software structure like a Facebook that supports us at, because we don't want, you know, we want to put up scientific publications or here's a new gene sequence or something instead of, you know, here's a picture of me drunk at the party last night. And, um, and, and I've talked to a number of the social network folks about this. Um, 
it's so bizarre that the, the people who gave us the internet and the web, that came from like CERN and NCSA and uh, ARPA and so forth, to become a mass market thing. Now the mass market has produced this incredible revolution in making explicit the social network connectivity of us as primates, we're very much a social species. Um, and yet we are in, the, I mean, the fact that I tweet, you know, most of my colleagues say, you know, what the hell is that about? Why are you doing that, you know? And it's because if you don't do it, if you're not on Facebook, you're not tweeting, you, nobody knows you exist to first order compared to what does happen in this new world that Jonathan and his people have brought into, into being. And, and so, you know, I'm experimenting. I have my own live streaming portal now. I'm, you know, you can follow me at Smart Twitter if you want. Um, that was a commercial. <laughs> and why am I doing that? Because, because I think it's all going to change. I think the, the whole way we do science is going to be changed from this lateral infusion of social science tools that by and large, I have to say, most of my friends in astronomy and chemistry and physics and computer science are just ignoring or illiterate about. And I think that's got to change. Alan, quick, quick comment about a, five questions ago. There was a, some of the questions alluded to the fact that academia is dependent on industry for clouds and stuff like that. The real fact is uh, industry is completely dependent on academia. Right? I mean, if you guys don't produce the, the, the people that we hire, we're dead in the water. I mean, look at this poor guy. He's going to stay with what, how many people you have? You'll never grow up to be a really serious company. So, <laughs> so, if, they're, oh, they're, so if, if people have creative ideas about how we can uh, collaborate we, better yeah, using our clouds with, ac with academia, please. I mean, we're, we're thinking about this every day, at least at Google, and, and we're happy to hear ideas. Great. Please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>